Welcome to part six of the Gospel of Mark. We are making our way through this Gospel and we're having a great time. And in this video, we are still in part one. Jesus is doing his ministry in the region of Galilee, and we're coming to chapter six, verses one through 29. Now this is page eight of a cartoonist's guide to the Gospel of Mark. And so the first thing that I wanna do is offer you a reading of the text. He left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, Where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter? the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except the staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, It is Elijah! And others said, It is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I am beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests, and the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Now, this I call this passage uh, a missional sandwich with rejection bread because we have these three stories. The, the first and last story are stories of Jesus being rejected, and right in the middle of it is the mission of Jesus sending out the twelve. And so we see in Mark 6, 1 through 6, that Jesus is, um, he's, he's rejected by his hometown. These are the people who know him best. They knew him as a child. 
uh, as just one of the children of Mary and Joseph. And I, th I think this particular story just is a, a like a recap of the story of Israel, where prophets would come to Israel and they would be rejected again and again and again. And so uh, this is a little foreshadowing of what is going to happen where the entire country is going to reject Jesus as the Messiah. And we'll see that in just a minute. But right after he's rejected, he takes his 12 disciples and he sends them on a mission, two by two. And I, I think of this as a beautiful picture of what the mission of the church is today. And I like to call it the missional church. If you're not familiar with that language, the missional church, uh, I've got three places that I encourage you to go. First of all, if you want to compare this story to its parallels in Luke and Matthew, you can just click here to Luke chapter 10, where in earlier in Luke chapter 9, Luke tells the exact story where Jesus sends out the 12 disciples two by two. But then Luke enhances the story by adding a second one where Jesus sends out 70 of his disciples uh, two by two and gives them these instructions that they, if they go into a town and they find a person of peace, they're supposed to stay there and um, receive and eat whatever is given to them. And they're supposed to do the work of healing. So that's Luke's version. And then if you come over to Matthew, Matthew actually takes the story of the sending of the 12 and turns it into one of the five key discourses in the whole gospel of Matthew, where Jesus gives really specific instructions. And here we see um, the the reflection again of the twofold ministry that we've seen throughout Mark so far. There's two basic parts of this mission. One, proclaim the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. That's the proclamation. And then there is the action. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, and cast out demons. See, the, the vision and mission of God in the world is to bring healing and wholeness and restoration. And so here's a little graphic that I put together that just gives the four basic parts of this mission. One, travel light. Like don't be uh, burdened by the stuff of the world. Be a guest. And this is counterintuitive to, you know, for the last uh, couple centuries in Western Christianity, at least, the idea of missions has been to send people out and convert people and invite people to come in. And especially in our, I'm in the United States of America, and in our imagination of evangelism in the church, it's like invite people to come to church, right? Invite people to leave what they are and become like us. Where what Jesus told us to do was to go into people's contexts and be a guest in their context and bring healing. That's the whole point of the, the kingdom of heaven is to bring healing and restoration and wholeness to people. And some people are going to reject that uh, for various reasons. And when they reject it, just brush it off. Move on to the next people um, to do the work. Don't, don't be adversarial. Um, just be like, okay, you know, that's what you want. We're going to move on to a, find a person of peace and do the work. Now, if you're interested in missional church stuff, you can click right there and you'll come to my, uh, my page on missional church where I've got a whole bunch of resources. Um, but simply put, the missional church is the triune God has a mission the Missio Dei, to restore and recreate all things according to God's original and ongoing vision of peace and wholeness. And uh, I invite you to look through all of these resources that I've put together on the missional church, and there's a lot there. So that is the mission of the church. And then we end with the second rejection, where we have this horrible story, where Herod Antipas, who is the, the king of Israel officially, um, is, is trapped by his own pride into executing John the Baptist. Now, here's what I think is going on. I think that all of the Gospels and the book of Acts use Herod Antipas 
as the contrast where we have, it's a tale of two kings. We have Herod Antipas, who is technically the king of Israel, who actually doesn't have rights to the throne. He's not a He's not of the line of David. He's actually been appointed by the Roman Empire, so he is a puppet king to empire. And the whole Herodian dynasty uses treachery and fear and intimidation, and they hoard wealth. This is the antithesis. This is the anti-king, where Jesus is the true king, the true Messiah of Israel, and the kind of king that God has always wanted, because this is a king who, whose primary mission is to serve the people, even to the point, like Isaiah predicted, a suffering servant, a king who would actually give up his own life before he would ever uh, hurt his own people. And so, um, but here in this story, I think what Mark is doing is this marks the pun intended, this marks the official rejection from the institution of the kingdom of the true Messiah and the message of the kingdom, this beheading of John the Baptist. And this sends a signal to Jesus that the country is not going to accept him as the Messiah, and he also is going to die for his people. So that is powerful stuff, and that is... Um, Mark 6, 1 through 29. We'll see you in the next video.